All right. So the courses of instruction, Harvard's course catalog has several thousands of courses. There's several hundreds of faculty, and there's several dozens of fields, computer science just being one of them. And I thought we'd use this as an opportunity to start thinking about how to implement a standard web-based application using PHP and Laravel, and also how we might model some of these real-world entities. So to do this, we'll use Laravel, which is just a framework that adds a lot of features to PHP, much like Django adds the same to Python, Rails adds the same to Ruby. So there's a couple of different ways in which you can install Laravel. The documentation for Laravel, as you may recall from last week, is actually pretty rich, and you can certainly, on your own at home, play around with this and follow the instructions specifically. But I'm going to go ahead and just give us a quick whirlwind tour of some of them, similar to what Tim did the other day. And I'm first going to use this. So Composer is sort of a new and improved feature for the PHP world that makes it easier to install things. If you're familiar with apt-get in the Ubuntu world or Debian world or yum in the uh, Fedora and Red Hat world, this is just yet another tool that allows you to install things for, your, uh, for this particular environment. So if I do Composer, Create, Project, and so forth, which I'll do here, Let's go ahead and just, I'll walk you through some of these steps as we did, whoops, last time without the percent sign. Damn it, without Composer. So with Composer, I'm using a different virtual machine than I did before. Let's do this real fast. All right, so installing Composer is as simple as this. So I'll, make a, I'll get up on my soapbox for a while, too. This is actually a very increasingly common paradigm for installing things on people's computers these days, where you essentially retrieve an arbitrary URL, pipe it through an interpreter, and then just do what that arbitrary chunk of code you just downloaded uh, says to do. Uh, it's very easy, as you're about to see, but realize the skeptic in you should think that this is among the more insecure things you could ever do, downloading an arbitrary file from the internet and then blindly running it by way of the pipe. But we will trust that the installer is, in fact, legitimate today. I'm going to go ahead and run this. And this is going to download the program. It's going to download a file called composer.far, PHP archive. And I'm going to go ahead and do this. sudo uh, first, actually, chmod755, composer.far, which is going to make it executable by everyone. And then I'm going to do sudo mv composer to user local bin composer. And what is user local bin for those familiar with Linux? And to be clear, I'm doing this inside of the appliance, even though I'm using terminal on my Mac. It's the global folder where you store your binaries so you can make the EU and the LS and the other local programs in the system. Exactly. So in a directory, and actually, slight clarification, in a directory typically called slash bin or slash user bin are indeed some very popular programs like CD and LS and so forth. In user local bin, by convention, is nothing by default. And we, the users of the system, can put anything we want in there. And by default, it's in your so-called search path, so that when you just type composer, the operating system, Linux, is going to look in that directory, among others, to find the program in question. And it turns out that it's fine to rename it with the file extension because we've made it executable. This thing will actually run as we intend. OK, so now I'm going to go back to the line I proposed we execute earlier, which is this, composer. And then it takes a command line argument, which I know only from reading the documentation, called create-project. I need to specify the name of the project on which I want to base mine. And Laravel slash Laravel essentially refers to a GitHub repository in which that code lives. Um, catalog is an arbitrary name I'm going to give to my project, the course catalog, but you could call it foo or anything else. And then prefer dist. It's a little cut off. It just means prefer the latest distribution. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Enter. And as Tim said on Wednesday, it can sometimes take a while, especially if you're on a slow connection or if you haven't cached some of these things. But what this is doing is it's checking out a whole bunch of code from online. It's slowly going to download it to my computer. And when it's finally done, I'm going to have a directory called catalog, inside of which is uh, project directory. Oops. That's why. Catalog. Let's do that again. OK, don't run that when apparently you have an existing catalog directory, and it notices that at the last minute. Um, this is going to have for me a directory called catalog, inside of which is all the code I need to start writing a web-based application with Laravel. So within a few seconds, this should kick in. And once we have this, and again, if you're not at the point where you're able to follow along right now, it's totally fine. It's pretty easy to recreate these steps afterward in your own appliance. Come on. All right. 
All right, in the meantime, as we do this, I'm going to pull up one other hint. So you might have seen Tim mention or edit this file last time. What is an Etsy host file and where does it live? All right, let's roll back in time. What is DNS? As we discussed not too long ago. All right, so domain name system. This is just the infrastructure on the internet that does what in a sentence? Yeah. When you type in a page like www.google.com, it gives you the IP, so you have to do another little arrow. Exactly. It converts domain names to IP addresses and vice versa. So it's effectively a big database table with at least two columns that have fully qualified domain names in the left and IP addresses in the right, for instance. And it just converts the two. Now, that's all fine and good, but if you actually want to create new host names on the internet, new domain names on the internet, you typically have to give someone money. You have to configure things on their server, their name servers, and so forth, which is a real pain. And especially if we don't really want to buy a domain name, we just want to pretend like we have our own local domain, for instance, called catalog or catalog.com or anything like that. Well, Etsy host allows you to hard code mappings between host names and IP addresses on your own local computer so as to essentially trick the computer into thinking that that domain name actually exists at that IP. It is checked first before the actual DNS system itself is checked. So let me go into this terminal window and it looks like in the background there everything had downloaded successfully. So what I'm now going to do is the following. Um, if you're more familiar um, from your 50 or 51 days with gedit, I'm going to go ahead and do this with gedit at first. But I'm going to go ahead and do sudo gedit slash etsy hosts inside of the appliance. And when I do this, I'm going to get a window that looks like this one here. Some somewhat cryptic lines only because they're long. But essentially, it's mapping 127.0.0.1 to a few different host names, one of which is localhost, one of which is appliance, and then a couple more, localhost.localdomain, appliance. Dot local domain. These are just conventions to use things like localhost as a default host name and local domain as a default top level domain or TLD. So notice what I already did in advance here. If I want to trick the appliance into thinking that catalog is indeed a real website on the internet, I can tell the appliance that its IP address is 127.0.0.1. Now, why that address? What is that IP? Where did it come from? Who did I have to ask for that? What's that? It's the loopback address, which simply means this is the default IP address given to most any computer on, in the world that supports IP, internet protocol. And it's a loopback address in the sense that it's reflexive. It refers to itself. So all of us, if we have an appliance or even a Mac or PC, have a local IP address of 127.0.0.1. And it's only used so that you can talk to yourself. I could, in theory, figure out what the appliance's IP address is and type in 192.168 or whatever that number is. But it's not necessary. This one is going to be invariant, and it will simply always work. So once I save that, that ultimately means that in a browser, I can go to HTTP colon slash slash catalog, as I'll do here. But a few things are broken out of the gates. So what does this typically mean? When I don't have permissions forbidden to do something, what's your first instinct to solving this problem? I did download a directory called catalog into my vhosts directory, which from last week, recall, is where all of our sort of local websites will live. What might be broken? How to fix? Permissions. Permissions of what? OK, files, potentially. So let's go back to our terminal window here. I'm in my vhost directory. Let me do ls. And notice there's a few things. Localhost, which comes with the appliance. We put it there. Uh, Catalog.original, which I put there earlier. That's sort of the finished version of what we're about to dive into. And catalog, which I just downloaded. If I want to look at the permissions on the catalog directory, I can do ls-l. And notice that they are a little different from the others. What permission is apparently the catalog directory, which we just downloaded, lacking by default? Even if you have no idea what the word is, you can surely infer what's different about each of these three lines. OK, what's missing between line one and line two of the output? Yeah. Yeah, so it's missing the X, which stands for executable. And what does it mean if a directory is executable? It just means you can open it. You can CD into it. You can access files inside of it. So if a file is executable, 
means it's like a program you can run. A directory is executable if you can go into it. So I can fix this with a few ways. I could do chmod a plus x, which means all plus executable. And then I can say catalog. Or recall from CS50 or not other classes, I can be a little fancier and say 0711, or more simply 711 on catalog. Hit Enter. Nothing seems to happen. But if I do ls-l again, notice that it's executable by my group, which is the middle three bits, and by all, which is the right three bits. And it suffices for those to be identical for our purposes. All right, I feel like we're in pretty good shape. Let's go back to the browser. And let's reload. Damn it. Still forbidden. So what else might be broken? Where else might we want to look? So we fixed catalog. So if I go into catalog, let's do another ls. Now there's more stuff in here. And frankly, at first glance, it's overwhelming. And I dare say this is one of the headaches of frameworks out of the gate in that you sort of have a lot to deal with. But we'll home in on what's important today. And the most important thing for now is this directory. If you've used the appliance before, you might know that the publicly accessible directory is called public. Or in years past, it was called HTML. But we've since changed it to the more common public. So if I do chmod711 of public, that would seem to fix that issue. So now the public directory is also executable and therefore accessible. Let's see if we're one step closer. Let's reload. Still no good. And now it's going to get a little challenging. This one's a little harder. If I go into public, recall that Tim showed us this one. If I do ls-al, which lists all files in the long format, there's a dot file, so to speak, where a dot file is just a file whose file name begins with a dot. What does htaccess do? Well, let's look in that. Rather than use gedit, I'm going to use vim. You can use emacs or nano or any of your preferred editors. But if I look in here, this has a bunch of low-level stuff that came with Laravel's distribution. This is a file that the Apache web server understands. And long story short, these several lines of configuration trick the whole public directory into routing almost all HTTP requests to take a guess. Which file? All incoming HTTP requests, with a few exceptions, will be routed to what file? Otherwise known as a front controller. Index.php. Index so even if there's a foo.php file or a bar.php file in my public directory, the meaning of these lines in general is to route all requests to index.php, unless those files do indeed exist, because things like dash bang dash f means if the file name doesn't exist. And if the directory doesn't exist, route all requests to index.php. So in a bit, this is going to allow us to have URLs like HTTP, colon slash slash catalog, slash courses, slash 123, where 123 is the unique identifier for a course, but is clearly not the name of a file. So that request is going to be routed to index.php, who's going to figure out, thanks to Laravel and you, where to route that incoming HTTP request. But there's a problem. Notice that by default, that htaccess file is not readable or executable. Executability is not important, but I do want to do chmod644 on .htaccess or a plus r. Now notice that, whoops, now notice that if I do an all listing, now it's readable. Now if I cross my fingers here and reload, whew, we have it up and running. So stupid steps that you need to go through at first. But the fact that I sort of went through it so pedantically is exactly the kinds of diagnostic steps you th should think about whenever something's wrong. And even when a directory might be awry, realize there might also be dot files, in particular .htaccess, which are quite common in any Apache distribution, which might create headaches like that one. So I'm getting a little tired of going back and forth to the appliance. I'd much rather work on my Mac or even on my PC. So how can I do the same Etsy host trick? Well, notice that first. Let me figure out what the, I, the appliance's IP address is. I can do ifconfig, which shows me some fairly cryptic output. But notice next to eth0, there, or rather next to eth1, there's this IP address here. I'm going to go ahead and copy that. And inside of my own Mac's terminal window, I'm going to edit sudo etsy hosts on my own Mac, which make, gives me a similar looking file. All I'm going to do is this. So I'm going to trick my Mac into thinking that HTTP colon slash slash catalog actually maps to that specific IP address. All right, so let's go ahead and save this. Now let me close that terminal window. And now on my Mac, using any browser I want, HTTP colon slash slash catalog 
and I see the same thing. Now I don't even have to bother going back into Fedora, which you might not like to do anyway. So now I'm back on my own computer using really the appliance as just a web server. All right, so here's just a quick uh, recap of some of the file permissions we might want to change, and I cut some corners since things like the fav icon aren't all that interesting for now. All right. So now let's start to configure this default Laravel installation for a database. So Tim did this briefly last time too. And the file in question is this one here. So inside of, let me change this to be consistent, catalog app config database.php. So let's go into app, let's go into config, and let's go into database.php. So this is a pretty long file, most of which is comments. But you'll see, if you read through this closely, that you can configure Laravel and a lot of frameworks to support different types of databases. Maybe you're using MySQL, maybe you're using Postgres, maybe you're using SQLite. There's other things. But if we're using MySQL, which happens to be the default here, notice that I want to change a few things. The host name is going to be localhost. That's fine, because the code is running on the appliance. The database, I'm going to go ahead and call catalog. The username, I'm going to call jharvard. And the password, I'm going to call crimson just based on the documentation for the appliance. And that's all the changes I'm going to make there. But now, if I actually want to start using the database, what more can I do? So when you've made web applications in the past, probably in CS50, maybe on your own, you've probably used a tool like phpMyAdmin or other client-side software to create your tables. And that's fine. But now you're going to start working with friends on this project. And it's going to be a bit of a pain if you have to start exchanging emails or Asana tasks saying, oh, hey, everyone, by the way, I changed the foo field to be uh, char 16 instead of char 8. Please, everyone, update your tables. Right, and so forth. It's very hard to imagine a world in which you're keeping all of your various copies of your forthcoming projects synchronized if you just have to rely on sort of the honor system and word of mouth. So instead of creating database tables manually, a very common paradigm that we'll adopt here too is to use what are called migrations. Is anyone familiar already with what a database migration is or what it refers to? You were slightly nodding. Yeah, exactly. A migration file is essentially a script that contains commands like create table, create field, create field, add index, add data, and so forth. And they effectively become diffs or differentials over time, whereby you might initially create your table. And thereafter, if you ever make a change to your table, you don't edit that file. You create a new script that changes, that alters your MySQL tables, and then you share with your partners that differential file so that he or she then runs the same thing thereby changing their tables to match yours. Now, there's different ways to do this in different frameworks. Um, Laravel comes with a script called artisan, which you can run by running PHP artisan. Then you give it a special command, migrate colon make, which just make, means make me a migration script, and then a name for what that script is going to do. And in theory, you can put a huge number of statements inside of a migration file. But in general, you want one file per table that you're touching just to keep things nice and orderly. So let me go ahead and run this. And I have to run this in my, uh, in my catalog directory, which is where Artisan, the green executable there, lives. Create courses table. Notice that it does some things. Seems to give me back at the prompt. And now notice this. If I go into app, database, migrations, and then do ls, there is a funky named file that's pretty similar to the name I wanted to give it. What's the reason for? these numbers at the beginning, do you think? Sorry? No dates. Uh, the dates and the time. Why is it useful to have put a timestamp at the beginning of the file name, no less? Exactly. This is sort of a poor man's way of ensuring that these scripts are always going to be sorted chronologically because we're sorting them by file name. So if we continue to make new migrations in the future, presumably time is going to move forward in reality. So these numbers are going to get incremented, which means when your partner runs the sequence of same scripts, he or she is going to run them in exactly the same order. That's why it looks a little cryptic. So let me go ahead and open this and see what's inside there. If I open this, notice there's a few things. One. It's a class in PHP, so there's object-oriented programming going on um, inside of Laravel fundamentally. It's arbitrarily called create courses table. It extends an existing class that came with Laravel called um, migration, which if you really poked around, you would see there's some built-in functionality that makes our lives easier. Notice that we are using some modules, essentially, at the top of the file there, using the use keyword. And then there's generally, both in Laravel and a lot of frameworks, 
two functions or methods that you have to implement, up and down. Up means what changes do you want to make to create new things. Down means if you undo this migration, what changes should you undo? What fields should be deleted? What fields should be unaltered? And so forth. So uh, down is the opposite, truly, of up in this case. All right, so if I want to create a course catalog, I now need to start building my tables. And where are we going to get the course catalog from? Well, some of you might have seen in the past that CS50, for instance, has a whole bunch of APIs. And these APIs expose data in different formats. And one of them is CSV, which is super simple, but not nearly sophisticated enough for our purposes. But let me scroll down to a few methods that come in this API. The courses API essentially lets you hit an, a URL like this. And it will give you back, if using CSV format, a dump of data that looks like this. It's a little messy because it's a lot of data, but notice the first row in the CSV is going to specify the column header. So catalog number, term, bracketed field, number, uh, title, faculty description, and a whole bunch of other fields. Similarly, if we look at the other methods in this API faculty, you can get a dump of all faculty in the database. And every faculty member has an ID number, first name, middle name maybe, last name, suffix maybe, and so forth. And then lastly, there's fields like computer science and uh, English and other such things that give you back a dump like this, but for all the available fields in the database. So to use this actual API, you, you need an API key, and then you need to query it. And that's not all that interesting for today's purposes. So if you actually, in the, when the time comes in a bit, just go to cs164.net and go to the talks page. We've actually linked directly to some dumps of those CSV files. So ultimately, today, you can just import them and not have to worry about using some random API like that. We'll give you the raw data. So how might we want to represent a course? Well, let me go ahead and go into my pre-baked version here and open up app, database, migrations, and then my migration file. I'm going to propose that we implement the up method as follows. And I know this only from reading Laravel's documentation. First, there's a class that comes with Laravel called schema. There's a static method inside of it called create. And that's going to create a table, in this case, called courses. This is apparently asynchronous in that when that creation is done happening, which might take milliseconds or seconds to, uh, to pass, we're going to be passed to this anonymous function called uh, this anonymous function, a parameter called table, via which I can now access that newly created table in the database, and I can proceed to add columns and indexes and other interesting things. So I'm going to keep my course catalog simple for now. I'm going to give every course an ID number, and notice that again, I only know this from the documentation. It turns out that if I call the increments method, if I read the documentation, that just means give me an auto incrementing integer as a column in my table. So you can do the same with PHP MyAdmin. This next function here specifies table string. Give me a string field, essentially a var char field called title, and add a unique constraint on it. That's all that's doing there. And then lastly, this is saying, give me some default timestamps, which are very popular with various frameworks because it facilitates certain operations. And by default, this is going to give me a created at timestamp and an updated at timestamp, just automatically. So in short, these three lines collectively create the SQL queries that I would otherwise need to hard code or execute through something like PHP MyAdmin to actually create this table as uh, simply as that. If I want to undo all of this, it suffices for me to implement down as essentially doing the opposite. I don't have to bother removing each field individually. I can just drop the whole table. And that has the effect of undoing all of those changes. So if I now run this migration, I'll get that table. If I roll the migration back, I'll drop that table. So we have indeed reversed the effects. So how do we actually run this migration? Well, let me go ahead and copy the code we just saw into my uh, current file. And let me go ahead and pull up what we'll want to run. So if we run now ph, actually, uh, if we, let me pull up where all of this is from, uh, Laravel, just so you have a point of reference. And if we go to migrations and seeding. So we're about to do two steps back to back. So one, we already created the table. And here is the command, php artisan migrate, which is actually going to run all of our migrations in chronological or really in alphabetical order. So if I go back to my directory here, go back to catalog, and run php artisan migrate, damn it, unknown database catalog. 
how to fix this. Yeah? Maybe a path is broken. Oh, maybe, but it's even simpler than that. We can literally take this error message at its word. I'm using Laravel at the moment to create my table, but not to create my database. That is presumed to happen in advance. So if I actually just go back over here to PHP my admin, let me go to my databases tab and just say, give me a database called catalog. It's going to create no tables in it. All it does is create database catalog. But now if I rerun, migrate, now it's run successfully. It just needed an actual database to store these files in. So if I now go back to PHP my admin and reload, notice what I see. I see a courses table, and if I go in there, notice the fields that it has. An ID, which is of type int, it's unsigned, can't be null, and it auto increments. So that's what the increments method did all um, automatically for me. It has a title, which by default is 255, which we said last time is a common value for a varchar, but overridable. And then these two co uh, columns we got for free by calling the timestamps method. Meanwhile, if I look at my indexes, Notice that I have one, which is a primary key on the ID column. And then there's this unique constraint on the title column, which I also asked for as well. All right. But there was this other curiosity. If I go back to my table, what other table was apparently created? Not just courses, but migrations. So why did Laravel presumptuously create a table called migrations, do you think? What might be the role of this table that's been created presumptuously for me? Well, you need to kind of maintain state, right? You don't want to constantly try to recreate your tables or re-alter your tables. So somewhere, Laravel has to remember what's been done. And the most convenient place, if the whole point of a migration is to edit a database, is to store that metadata in the database. So if we look at the migrations table and click Browse, notice that essentially this is just a super simple table that Laravel creates for itself to just remember which migrations have been run. So that if you and your partners get out of sync, Laravel on an individual partner's computer knows which migrations have or have not been run. So that Laravel, when you run PHP artisan migrate, will only run the migrations that actually need to happen. All right, that's all fine and good. But now let me actually seed the database with some information. I don't want to do this all manually. So it turns out that in advance, I prepped the following file. Let me go ahead and copy this one too from my original code. Uh, da database seeds, and in here I have the following file. So in app database seeds, and this code is all downloadable on the course's website on the talks page, notice I've done the following. This is very similar in spirit to migration, but this is just about giving your partner some sample data or maybe even some real data to work with. So here I'm calling, I'm implementing a function called run inside of an arbitrarily named class called courses table seeder, but it extends an existing Laravel class called seeder, which is important. And this run function, again, just steals some syntax from Laravel's documentation in order to delete the table called courses, if, uh, delete all the rows in a table called courses, if there are any, and then just manually insert CS1, CS50, and CS51, just like last week. So all this does is it populates our table with some sample data. So if I want to run this, it suffices to run PHP artisan db seed, which I'll do again in my catalog directory, like that. Now if I go back to PHP my admin, which is just a convenient tool for looking at all of this, and go into courses, now I have, whoops, uh, what did I do wrong? Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. App database seeds. Ah, I will fix this momentarily. It's because I copied the file instead of creating it manually. So when I wave my hands, this will actually populate the database table with the following fields, which we'll do as follows. CS1, CS50, and if we insert one more, CS51. And because of the auto incrementing feature, this is the table we would have had, but with actual last, uh, last modify created at and updated at fields. I'll roll back and fix that afterward. All right. So we're almost there to the interesting part where we can actually start doing something and not relying on Laravel itself. First, take note at this URL in particular is all of the various commands that you can execute in order 
to build up your schema. So all of the stuff we talked about last week still applies, knowing about uh, var chars and chars and ints and big ints and the like. But there's now simply functions in PHP or methods in PHP that when using this framework, you want to call instead so that all of this is automatically generated for you. And that's at that URL here. And you see things like enums and doubles and decimals and all of the fields with which you might already be familiar. But once we've done that, we now need to start writing some code. And ideally, I don't want to think about SQL anymore. And indeed, that's the beauty of sometimes using these layers, like in Laravel, and it's eloquent ORM. Indeed, if I go into uh, app models, by default, there's a user uh, file there, which we're not going to use. That just comes with the sample Laravel distribution. But if I go ahead and copy in the distribution code from the course's website, we'll see this file. That's all it takes to represent a course object using Eloquent, which again is the name of the ORM we're using. And again, object relational mapper, that's just the layer of software that's going to somehow convert our code to database queries. So once I've done that, I can start doing even more interesting things. I'm now going to go ahead and create a controller. So now we're getting to the C in MVC. And let me do this in my catalog directory. Enter. And now if I go into app controllers, notice the following. I have a course controller which has a whole bunch of empty to-dos effectively. So where are we going with this? Well, now let me go ahead and put aside this temporary catalog we've been making and actually move into place the one that I prepared in advance. So that was my original. Let me go ahead and call that catalog, go into catalog, and give you a sneak preview by going to the web page we were at earlier and now showing that here is the beginnings of our course catalog. And in these final moments, I'll walk us through what code is already there in place and what it represents. So one, if I click on courses, notice that I'm actually going to be able to see CS1, 50, and 51. I can go one step further and view more details by clicking the View button. There's not much there because the only information I've provided is titles, not yet descriptions or anything. I can click Edit and get an editable form here, via which I could, in theory, update the title, and if it actually existed in the database, the description. So let's go and see how this is actually done. And Tim and I, in the uh, moments to come, in the latter half of today, will actually remind you how to do some of these things and answer any questions. One of the most important files, really a place to start, in use, getting your first project started is going to be in, in app.routes.php. This is the file that essentially routes incoming HTTP requests to code that you have written. There's three lines that we've put here for now. One, and we'll do them in reverse order. I'm going to specify a route controller for slash. So if the user visits slash, what class do you want to handle that request? In consistent with Laravel, uh, consistent with Laravel, I chose to route that request to base controller. So let's suspend that thread for a moment and then take a look in app controllers base controller to see what's there. And there's relatively little. There's three methods. This one comes with Laravel's base controller when you first download the code. And all this does is configure my website with a so-called layout. A layout is a default template that's going to give you standard HTML tags, title tags, body tags, and everything except the guts of the web page, typically. But up here, I added a couple of things. I specifically said that I want to have a default layout or template called master. So somewhere in my directory structure, there's a file called master dot php or master dot blade dot php, which just means it's using a certain templating library. And it's in a directory called layouts. Lastly, by following Laravel conventions, I implemented my own method whose prefixed with the name of the HTTP verb I want to listen for. And verbs include get, what else for HTTP? There's get, there's post, and there's a few others, which we'll come back to. So if I want to get index, and index is just a special symbol that means slash, so get index, this is the method that will automatically be called as a result of our having written routes.php in this way, so that when this method, get index, is called, what do I do? Well, on the right-hand side, notice that I call a method called make, which is inside a class called view. And the view I want to make or render is apparently called index.php or index.blade.php. We'll come back to that in a moment. And where do I put that? I want to jam the results of this template inside of this bigger template's content area. 
So when I said a moment ago, the layout is like your default template, which has some HTML and title and body tags up here, and a closed body and a closed HTML tag here. The content is all the stuff in the middle. So I'm jamming the results of this method call inside the body of that overarching master template. And then that's what gets spit out to the user. Specifically, that's what I'm seeing when I am at the home page here. So what is this index file? Where, what am I making? Well, let me go into app views index.blade.php. And it's called Blade by convention simply so that you have access to certain features of this templating engine, like automatically escaping so you don't have to use atrocious things like HTML special chars anymore. So this is just a fragment of HTML inside of views slash index.blade.php. There's really nothing interesting going on. It's hard-coded HTML. There's no templating even. Um, I'm using some class names that you might know if you've used the Bootstrap CSS library, and that's just to help make things sexier than the default uh, would otherwise be. And notice that I'm just including a big button whose uh, href is slash courses slash create. And the content of that, if we scroll all the way over, is create a course, which is wrapping around there. That's why we're seeing a big green button called create a course. All of the stuff above it and all the stuff below it is coming from that master file, which if I go into views, layouts, master.php, notice here's all the hard-coded stuff at the top, here's all the hard-coded stuff at the bottom, and here is the content in the middle. So this is just a simple template, not even using blade features, so to speak, just using raw HTML and some PHP substitution. So that's how I get the same look for all of my pages. So now let's roll back. So a moment ago I said suspend that mental thread. Now we only have two lines left. And then you're off on your own for the most part. So here, there's a different method being used, resource. So it turns out whenever making web applications, particularly ones that have front ends and have back ends, it's nice to start thinking about things as having an API, an API you write that you yourself use. Or better yet, when you have a four-person team, an API that maybe one or two of you writes that the other one or two or three people use so that you can essentially work in isolation of each other. And a common way to think about the operations you might want to support for an API is by a way of this silly acronym known as CRUD, Create, Read, Update, Delete, where the first letter of each of those is where you get the silly acronym. But we can translate this notion of CRUD into SQL terminology. So you're familiar roughly with SQL, and you know that there's insert, select, update, delete. So that's just how those familiar terms map on to this silly convention of CRUD. But a very common paradigm, because by creating, reading, deleting, and updating, you can pretty much change your data in any way you want. And if we go one step further with HTTP, this is the con these are the conventions that humanity has adopted. If you want to create a new course, for instance, the convention using RESTful programming, R-E-S-T, is to use an HTTP post to a particular URL. If you want to get a course and its title and description and all of that, you'll typically use HTTP GET at a specific URL. If you want to update it, you'll actually use another verb with which you're probably less familiar, known as PUT or PATCH, actually does a subset of updating if you want. And then lastly, this one's just kind of nicely redundant. If you want to delete, there's an HTTP verb called delete. So what does this mean? Well, is in years past, when you're familiar generally with the idea, just so I have a little scratch pad here, you know that HTTP requests generally look like this. Well, these other commands are exactly the same. It's either post HTTP 1.1 or it's delete slash HTTP 1.1. But there'll typically be something specific there, like courses slash 1.1. Two, three, and that would delete course number one, two, three. So that is simply a mental model to keep in mind, particularly because, not to confuse things too much, whereas the world has kind of come up with these mappings for all of these different mental contexts, Laravel has its own. And this is the last such mapping you need to keep in mind. So on the left hand column here are all of the verbs we just talked about. In the middle column, are the paths, the URLs that I was verbally alluding to a moment ago. And on the right-hand side are the names of the methods that Laravel would like you to implement if you want to support things like create, reading, update, and delete. So for instance, in the future, if we want to select a, all courses, for instance, we would issue an HTTP GET 
to slash courses. So resource here is just a generic placeholder for whatever thing you actually want to get. We might get slash faculty. We might get slash fields to get all such fields. Meanwhile, if we want to create a course, what this chart means is that you should actually post an HTTP request to slash courses. And specifically, on the back end, your partner had better implement a PHP method called store to actually listen for that operation. And let's choose one other one arbitrarily. If you want to delete course number 123, you would issue an HTTP delete to slash courses slash 123. Or meanwhile, your partner, in order to make sure you can do that, he or she has to implement a PHP method called destroy. I have no idea why the world can't just agree on the same words for all of these things. That's why we need these little cheat sheets. But the ideas are really as simple as four operations, creating, reading, updating, and deleting. So what does that mean in real terms? Well, if I go to this sample application, notice the following. I can click create a course. Actually, to be clear, notice I'm at slash at the moment. If I click create a course, Notice I'm at slash courses slash create. And this is consistent with, if we go back to the chart, notice that this is consistent with the second row. If I want to create a new thing, I'm going to go to slash resource slash create. And if I want to type in CS61, I'm going to leave course description blank because we don't support it yet and click submit. There's my description page. Notice that I've just been redirected to slash courses slash four, which is the auto incremented ID that was assigned. That was indeed an HTTP GET. And if I go back to now courses, there's CS61. And just to prove that this is actually doing what's promised, if I browse the PHP database, uh, the uh, MySQL database again here, there indeed is CS61. So, how did we support that? And this is where these frameworks actually start to get pretty powerful because it's relatively easy to implement that. So this line here specifies consider slash courses, aka courses, the forward slash is assumed, to be a resource, where a resource means a RESTful resource that supports CRUD operations. And pass all such requests, get, post, delete, and put, and patch, to course controller. Course controller, meanwhile, was the thing I created earlier, which is in the controller's directory. If I open this file, notice that there's an index method, a create method, a store method, a show method, an edit method, and so forth. In short, Laravel and I have collectively implemented all of these method names inside of this file. And Laravel is going to take care of the process of figuring out, was this a get? Was this a delete? Was this a post? It will route the user to the appropriate line of code. So when I go to, for instance, courses, the URL for which is just slash courses, this is equivalent to executing this index file here. And this is where now the database and my C in MVC get linked. The M and the C get linked. Simply because I created a file in app models course.php and I defined a class in there, even though it doesn't seem to do anything, but it does extend the eloquent class, which is built in. That means I can now call course colon colon get. And this line of code, take a guess, is equivalent to executing what SQL query? Yeah. Exactly. Select star from courses. All of that automatically happens because I simply implemented that em otherwise empty course class. This returns to me apparently an array, a result set of sorts. I'm going to store that in a variable called courses. Now what's going on here? Well, this is the same convention as before. I grab my layout which is that master file by default. I jam into the content section in the middle the results of calling view make specifying courses.index. The dot's a little misleading. This just means that in a courses directory, in my views directory, there's a file called index.php or index.blade.php. And what does it mean to be passing in this? This is actually perhaps familiar from our MVC examples last week with our homegrown code. What is this probably doing, the second argument? Why am I passing in an array with a key called courses, apparent, do you think? Well, the whole point of MVC is generally to separate your logic, your controllers, from the aesthetics, like your views, from your database, the M. So our M, our model, has been abstracted away with this class here, course get. I have no idea anymore as a programmer that this stuff is coming from a MySQL database. That's what the M is doing for me, abstracting all of that away. This is my view. 
My view is just aesthetics. It does not have any courses hard coded into it. But it probably has a for loop that is very willing to iterate over an array of courses and output like one TR, one table row per course, or one div per course. And so, sure enough, if I go into my views directory and go to courses slash index, let's do that views courses index.blade.php, here's another HTML fragment. And this is slightly new syntax, but if you read the documentation on Blade via Laravel's website, you'll see this funky notation up here, which looks almost like PHP, but it's not quite. It's because a, um, a preprocessor essentially strips it out. For each, courses as course. And what am I apparently outputting for every course in that array? Well, this is some bootstrap CSS for the most part, via which I'm outputting a course's title over up here. And then I'm outputting two buttons, one called view, which is slightly overwrapping one line, and one called edit. In other words, this is how I'm getting CS1, button, button, CS50, button, button, CS51, button, button. It's the result of this for loop. So when I go back to that controller, what's really going on is that the array called courses is being passed in to this template so that the view can just do its thing and iterate fairly mindlessly over an array without doing much more of anything. Meanwhile, if we scroll down, and we won't dwell on these, here is the method via which you can create a new course. Here is the method via which, or rather, uh, here is the method via which you can update a course with a new title. And in fact, let's look just at this one in closing for this example. If I do want to store a newly created course, so this is the store method. So to recap, this lines up with this row here. And that means if I want to actually store a new course there, notice the following. It suffices for me to instantiate a new object of type course, which has nothing inside of it by default. But then I can call input colon get. This is equivalent to getting, if you remember in PHP, dollar sign underscore get a bracket quote unquote title. This is sort of the abstracted way of doing that. I'm going to store that in a field called title and course. And then I'm going to call a method called save. If you're familiar with Active Record, popularized by Rails in particular, it's the same exact idea. I'm creating an empty object called course of type course, putting in a title, saving it to the database. And then lastly, I'm redirecting the user to courses slash ID number so that I see it as follows. So if I do this, let me go to my browser, home, create a course. We'll do it again. CS121, submit. Now I'm indeed at courses slash five which is the ID number. OK, so this is a lot all at once. But some of the high level takeaways, though, are one, just downloading Laravel and going through some sort of boring steps of configuring permissions, which is sort of old school but slightly distinct to Laravel. Two is actually using migrations to create your database tables. And to recap, why are migrations preferable, at least in this kind of environment, over just using PHP MyAdmin to create your tables? Yeah. Exactly. You don't have to worry about manually synchronizing your database with your teammates. And God forbid you have more than four partners, but a whole company, it just doesn't work beyond a certain point. So migrations help with that. A seed, meanwhile, is just a quick and dirty way of putting some sample data, typically into your database, so as to standardize that process as well. So eloquence, a so-called ORM, which we've really just seen as the class that you extend with other classes, allows us to do what? What was the whole point of introducing that as an ingredient here? Well, recall in CS50, if you did CS50 Finance last year or years ago, recall that every, we really blurred the line between C and M in that whole framework. If you wanted to uh, buy a stock or sell a stock, you pretty much just hard-coded SQL code inside of your PHP file, which was effectively a controller, like buy.php or sell.php. And that worked fine for a relatively simple application, but doesn't particularly scale. And there was also a lot of hard-coding and redundancy in code, lots of selects, lots of inserts, lots of updates. Notice I didn't write a single bit of SQL. Rather, by extending Eloquent, I get access effectively for free to all of these default names of methods that automatically do most anything I want in the controller. And in the, met in the model, notice I can just call get. I can just call save and similar methods in order to achieve a lot of the headaches that I used to have to do fairly manually. 